Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. We have a delightful interview today. We've just uh, completed. Uh, Judy, tell the folks the title of our podcast today. It is called Relationships at Work, an interview with June Shen Epstein. And June is a project manager at mm -hmm. Burton Snowboards. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't talk a lot about the, the companies, but uh, folks in Vermont really are well aware. And actually, Burton is known internationally. All over the world. All over you the place. You see their snowboards at the Olympics. Yep. Yeah. And um, and she was fascinating. I, I really enjoyed the yeah, conversation. Yeah. And uh, she's talking about, as a project manager, she's talking about, you know, that notion of work couples. Right. And again, she she'll she'll see you'll see when you see the you know, she shies away from the notion of work husband, work wife. But mm -hmm. that concept of couples mm -hmm. uh, came up in our conversation. We also had a listener listener question that addressed it. So uh, stay tuned and shortly after we do our little plug for the podcast and plug for the book, right. uh, we will um, be doing that interview and um, I trust you'll enjoy it. We certainly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's put in a plug for the podcast itself. Right. Um, you can, first of all, you can find the podcast and some information about it at our website. CTN7.com. CTN7, that's the number seven, CT for Couples Therapy, CTN7.com. Mm -hmm. And when you go there, you will see you have access to all of our episodes. And you also have the ability to sign up to be a guest if you want to, mm -hmm. which I think June did, as I recall. I believe, I believe she, she did. did. Yes. And we had already we, talked to her, actually. Right, we met we, her we elsewhere. Met her. But um, she did that, and it's just a way, a handy way of signing up for a time that uh, you'd like to be interviewed. And, you know, chances are, if you'd like to be interviewed, I'll bet you'll be a good guest. Now, we'll ask you in the process of your signing up, what do you want to talk about? And mm -hmm. we'll see if we think so, too. Right, and she proposed this topic to us, and it was something that we hadn't uh, even ever considered and thought about. So it was, it was novel, and uh, she had something really interesting to add to it. So, yep. So again, you'll hope you'll enjoy that. While you're at the uh, website, also don't forget our merch. merch, our beautiful couples therapy in seven words mugs in two sizes. What is it? Fifteen ounces and, and 11, eleven ounces. ounces. Yeah. And on one side it has the beautiful logo that Judy designed, and on the other side it has our inspiring message. Right, the seven, be kind, don't panic, and have faith. You have to count and. Too. I just, just noticed that with somebody the other day when I was describing seven words, and, and I said they what they were, six. and they said, that's just six, be kind, don't panic, have faith. And I said, no, no, you have to count and, and. like Smokey the Bear's middle name, which is the, the. yes, whatever. <laughs> uh, anyway, and seven's a better number. You know, yes. it had to be seven, yes, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, and also, um, you also, uh, you could find this on that website and you can also find this anywhere books are sold and that is... Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And that is the book that has been out now for a couple of years and uh, it is based on the seven words and um, lots of people have enjoyed it and given us a lot of good feedback and I hope you will too. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind mentioning now, I've got another book in the works right now. I've just finished the draft of and it's, we're getting comments and mm -hmm. hope that'll be out within some number of months, I don't know. Uh, and I, I don't even mind saying what the working title is, recognizing the publisher might insist that it change and I will fight back, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's called, because people have been telling me it's a great title. It's okay. called, It's Not About Communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. If that isn't a provocative title, mm -hmm. what is? You know. Mm -hmm. So watch for that, folks. But that's not out yet. So okay. we'll, we'll keep plugging it. But it's that's not out yet. If, by the way, if you want to be notified of that, you can email me, uh, Bruce at ctn7.com, and just say, "Hey, put me on your list so that I'll find out when the book comes out. You'll be one of the first to find out." And won't that be exciting? Won't that be exciting? Won't that be exciting? Okay, well, enjoy the interview and we will see you afterwards. Our guest today is June Shen Epstein. June graduated from Cornell University with a major in mechanical engineering and worked as a mechanical design engineer for several years before working as a stay at home mom and running her own business in which she taught sewing. When her second child got to kindergarten, she started working as a product developer at Darn Tough Vermont and subsequently moved to Burton Snowboards, 
first as a soft goods designer and more recently as a project manager. Through her work as a project manager, June realized the importance of relationship building, and she started thinking about how getting individuals to work together, even in couples formations, was such a big part of project management work. As June put it, project, man project managers have to manage conflict, conflict frequently. Easy for you to say. <laughs> And I discovered that most often this conflict happens between two people on a team together. So I often ask myself how to bring people together on common ground, how to help them speak each other's languages, how to build trust between them in order to repair working relationships. June, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. So uh, we have a, a few questions, and of course, we'll, we'll just take it whatever direction it goes. But the you know, first thing that occurred to me, I put together this one, tell us about what you do as a project manager at Burton. And especially, of course, we're wondering, how did, this, how did that work lead you to think about the role of relationships at work? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, when I first started work, went back to work after being a stay-at-home mom, of course, you guys probably know a lot of uh, learning and maturity happens when you're raising children, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. sort of watching how that works and, and building a lot of relationships in the community over that time. When I went back to work, of course, I love designing products and I love, you know, the hands-on tangible work there. But I also found that the work that I was doing was was really largely focused around process. How do we get things done so that people feel more comfortable in the work that they're doing? So that uh, people who are subject matter experts in the work that they do can really focus and shine on doing that work really well, as opposed to being bogged down in, in all the other stuff that's happening. You know, I found a lot of people um, exhibited a lot of discomfort at work when they didn't understand what was going on. So I sort of naturally ended up gravitating toward um, project management, which is a lot of bringing people together um, in, in a way to accomplish a goal. You know, projects are, are always goal oriented and produce a tangible result. Um, and a lot of it is also communication. Like how am I communicating to the whole group so everyone can do their work well? How are individuals communicating within that group um, so that, you know, their work partners are able to, to get work done? So I feel like it's interesting because I'm an introvert, but um, a lot of the work that I gravitate toward really is around people and how we do the work, why we do the work. Um, so I think I sort of exercise my extroverted muscles when I'm out at work in that way. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that is so interesting. I, I don't have uh, data on this. I am also quite introverted and love working with people. Mm -hmm. And lots of the therapists I know seem to me would describe themselves as introverted and love working with people. There's something about that. I think that, that, um, that role of being facilitator mm -hmm. that just, feels really satisfying. And again, even though I'm not somebody who's like going to run off to go to a party, although Judy will, and, and will, and I will, I have learned over the years to go with her and, and enjoy it. Then I end yes. up enjoying it. My initial reaction would be to say no, but fortunately she says yes. And then I benefit from it. No, it's really, it's really kind of cool, but that's interesting. You know, you're an introvert, but you're, you know, you're wanting to work with people on relationships. But I find that so true with a lot of introverts. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's because of that sensitivity um, and being able to watch things on the outside that maybe somebody else wouldn't notice and you pick up on that. I yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, people like to generalize extroverts as liking to be with lots of people and liking to have conversations and introverts as, as you know, you know, never liking to talk to anybody, but that isn't true. It's much more nuanced than that. And I think the introversion, the introverted, um, ability and capacity and desire to make real like deep connections one-on-one -on -one with people is something that makes a good project manager as well because you really have to understand individuals and how they're going to respond within a team and how they're going to respond to you know um issues that arise within within projects and so that aspect of it i think is really helpful within this job yeah, oddly enough, one of our guests um, 
whose last name happens to be Epstein. <laughs> I don't know if she's related, Susan Epstein. She um, is a life coach and she does a lot of stuff with Briggs Myers. My Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Myers Briggs. And you know, she has always classified herself as, as an introvert. And I, I wouldn't have thought that, but she said, look, look at the definition of an introvert. And mm -hmm. she deals a lot with people. She's a you know, retired teacher and she's now doing life coaching. Um, but yeah, I, I never would have thought of her as an introvert, but she told me she's an introvert, so I yeah. have to believe her. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I think you're right. It is more nuanced than that, uh, definitely. Um, you know, it was intriguing when you sent us the information that we constructed your bio out of, of course, uh, and you mentioned that notion of couples at work, mm. which is really fascinating. And we have not, as I recall, I don't. We haven't done this topic. No, this, you so know, that's you're why you're we're helping us to have it. So. Yeah, that's that's like wow. We, yeah, we haven't really touched on the notion of mm -hmm. couples at work. And I'm curious, you know, how do you understand that sense of couples? How are they? How are work relationships like? You know, couple relationships in other contexts, like personal. You know, like sure. Intimate. Whatever. Of course. Yeah. And actually I was thinking, you know, in, in preparation for this call, I was thinking about this this morning and, and whether or not um, the idea of work husband and work wife would come up in our conversation. So I'm kind of, I'm forcing it. Um, <laughs> and this is something, it is a belief that I hold very, very strongly. I, I really hate the term uh, work wife and work husband, because that is one way I think yeah. I differentiate uh you know, work couples or work partners from, you know, personal relationships. Like for me, a husband and wife is, is there's a very specific definition of it. And I, yeah. I don't like applying it at work. It feels really yucky to me yeah. um, because you have to have that professional boundary, I think in my, in my opinion. So um, that's maybe the very first thing that I'll, I'll say about it, but in terms of work couples and, and how it does relate with, with personal relationships with which is, I think, you know, what you guys specialize in. If we think about relationships as a whole and two people coming together and either choosing to be together or, you know, being forced to be together in, in the, in the sense of parent child, like you get, you get what you get, right? <laughs> you aren't, but in a, in a, in a life partner, you're making that choice. I, at I, work. I want to throw in right there if I can. You are making that choice, except it's amazing the numbers of couples I work with where they're questioning that choice. Mm -hmm. And in effect, I've often pointed out at that moment, they're in an arranged marriage. It's like, well, it, it, they happen to have picked themselves out originally rather than families or a matchmaker or something. Okay. But, you know, time and circumstance and history have arranged that they woke up that's, that morning and they're married and they're kind of stuck with that at the moment. They could change it, but that's where they're at. So even that is kind of a forced relationship in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think about that a lot, a lot of in terms of work, like you make a choice to be at work, right? Mm -hmm. You make a choice, you know, at least in our, you know, open market society, you it's you choose the company you work for, they choose to hire you. That's the first relationship, right? And it's, you know, it's an individual with an entity, but you have to figure out like, do I like the culture at at this company? Do I align, do the company values align with mine enough that I, I feel like I'll be able to, you know, not sacrifice any of my moral values to, to be there? Um, are the people that I'm interviewing with people that I feel like I could spend time with and, and have similar enough views, but also different enough views that they can challenge me to be a better person and grow as a person. So that's sort of the first step, right? Once you're in the work, you don't necessarily have those choices anymore, right? Like somebody may leave, a new person is hired. You, 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 you get assigned to be on a project team with this other person, and like, you know, you're the engineer, and and then you're working with this designer. You didn't have a choice in that necessarily. So then you have to figure out, okay, at the one-on-one -on -one level, what are the, what are the values that this person brings to work? You know, they might be different than their personal values. Certainly there's a there's an overlap in personal values and working values, but I spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to get other people to think about what are their working values? Is it is it being on time? Is it uh, trusting another person? Is it producing the, the best work that I can, but I need a, a bubble to do it in? And if the other person you're working with needs a lot of information from you, then that bubble mentality might not work, right? And so we, then, you know, as a project manager, if I have two people on a team that 
that sort of have fundamentally different working values. I have to spend a lot more time with them figuring out, okay, where, where can I find that, that area of agreement or um, that area where they, they do share the same values and work from there to figure out, okay, how can we change the way that you guys are working together so that you can meet in the middle in a way that doesn't feel bad to either one of you. And I feel like that type of work is so similar in, in couples therapy or relationship work, right? Like I, I'm married to my husband who's standing over here. As we grow and age together within our relationship, how do our values change? Are mm -hmm. we still going to be able to stay, stay married and together? Uh, it's, it's work, right? Like you have to constantly be learning from each other, figuring out how you're navigating within the world together in a way that that feels good to both of you and supportive to both of you. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do within the work world microcosm, right? Like it doesn't matter if you can go have a beer together and or, you know, have, you know, enjoy a picnic together or kickball. Can you do the work together in a way that mm -hmm. feels good and that you're learning with each other and pushing each other to be better as opposed to shutting each other out? I think yeah. that's that's interesting. You know, one one of the things you noted in there in terms of who you want to be working with, I think also applies to some extent who you want to be married to, which is you need there to be enough of an overlap of values, sort of core values, but you also need, it doesn't matter whether you need it, there will be differences. And those differences are generative if things are going well. You know, you, you're pushing each other to grow and it can feel challenging at times and also really wonderful at times. It can feel very alive. For couples where that is sort of interdicted, it can be really difficult. And I'm imagining, and well, it, not only imagining, remembering, you know, I've been, I've been in private practice now for 27 years. Before that, I was working a consulting gig for a while. So it's been a long time since I worked for a large entity. Uh, and you too, I think quite a while since, I mean, you worked for the temple for a long time, right. but yeah. it, it was, um, but I'm remembering, you know, sometimes the culture of the place or the procedures of the place, the structures involved interfere with that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you want to be able, well, actually, let me, let me introduce it in terms of my two of my favorite terms that okay. I don't know how many of our podcasts you've listened to, but you know, I, I read all about it in my book, stability and intimacy. Those are the, the two ways of describing these two sets of needs that we all have in relationships. And, you know, in a, in a marriage, intimacy also involves things like sexual intimacy. Obviously at work, we're not talking about that. I hope not. I hope not. Exactly. Well, and, and it's interesting because when that happens, it becomes a real nightmare, right? Yes, Often it, it becomes yeah. a real mess yeah, yeah. precisely because the structure there is not set up for that. Mm -hmm. right. But right. there are other forms of intimacy. If I speak in, in more general terms, and I would, I would wonder, and I'll sort of bounce this off you, and see what you think, that Stability is, of course, important. You know, all of the stuff in the employee handbook and all of the stuff about procedures and rules, and they're important because otherwise the place just blows up. It, you know, it, it can't stay on anything like on task. But intimacy, if that is cut off, what you lose is the energy for growth. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by intimacy there is the ability to be honest with yourself and each other. And I don't mean, you know, brutally honest. I mean, just fundamentally in sync with who you are. It feels alive when you're when there's intimacy happening and mm -hmm. it feels deadly when it isn't. And I'm curious, does any of that sort of fit in the work situation? Yeah, of course. I think, you know, that when I think about work intimacy, it's it has a lot to do with your comfort with yourself, comfort with the other person and trust in that relationship, right? Like, do we have a level of work intimacy where I can come to you after a meeting and say, hey, it, I really didn't like it when you said this about something that I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get it. Like, I love feedback. I, I want to do better. But the way that you said it in front of the group made me feel really bad. And mm -hmm. like that, you know, getting people to that level is often a goal of mine. Like, I want you to be able to talk with any person that you're struggling with don't come to me and yeah. complain to me about somebody, right? right? 
go to that person and, and tell them what made you feel uncomfortable or bad. And even better, tell them what made you feel amazing. Like people feel awkward about that too, right? Like if I go to somebody and it's like, man, it made me feel really good when you like, you know, praise this tiny piece of work that I did. I didn't think it was that important, but I loved hearing that it was important to you. People feel weird about doing that at work too. And I think so to me, that's what, what work intimacy is, is, is to be able to be honest and, and even brutally honest, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, and, and I have to work on that all the time. Like I know a lot of people at work perceive me as being very warm and open and, and inviting. And I want that, but I have to work at it. You know, sometimes I get into that you know, old engineering mindset that I have, which is very task focused, very professional, like all we're here to do is work. And then I have to, you know, actively remind myself, no, there's this huge other part of work um, that needs to be nurtured. Mm. So when, um, now were you working through COVID during the COVID time? Yeah, remote. Was it in person or was it on Zoom or how was business conducted? Um, we, We went totally to Zoom for... I don't want, I don't even know how long, quite a yeah, period of time. How, how is that in maintaining relationships? And did you see a difference of what was happening on Zoom versus what was happening before in person? And are you now back in person or is it still a Zoom or a hybrid or what's We're a hybrid on? now. Um, uh-huh. It's how funny. Is all that, so the thing is, how is all that affected these relationships and the intimacy and, and the office camaraderie that people have? Yeah, I think it's different for everybody. Um, for me, being an introvert, I, I loved it. You know, like once I was done with the meeting, it just it would just turned off. I didn't have to, you know, walk down the hall and make small talk with anybody. Um, <laughs> you know, and and there, you know, less background chatter. We have an open sure. office. Um, and the other thing that I found really valuable for me about Zoom meetings is I could see everybody on one screen. I could see everybody's physical and facial reactions to whatever was happening all at once. And it, it gives me these cues that I don't get in a larger conference room. When somebody unmutes, oh, they want to say something, but they're, you know, they're not brave enough to just start talking. So it makes it easier to do the things like inviting people in who are more shy um, and saying, hey, like I noticed you unmuted. Is there anything you, you know you feel like adding? Um, seeing people's facial reactions really helps me draw out, you know, what they what they need from from the group. But I, I do think in terms of those one-on-one calls, it so group calls much better for me on Zoom. But one-on-one calls I find not as good on Zoom. Um, I think people are able to hide their expressions a little more to control themselves a little more when they have that screen in between them. Um, I did conduct a couple of like, you know, issue management sessions with people sort of like, you know, let's, let's review what's going on. Let's talk through it together. And I found people weren't as straightforward with each other as I wanted them to be. They always would be with me, but not with each other. I don't know if it would be better in person because uh, I guess we haven't had the opportunity or or need to do that. Um, and of course, I think Burton particularly is known to be a very social culture. Yeah. Um, so I think overall, it has been more difficult for the company as a whole to be on Zoom and remote. Um, but I'm still, you know, we sort of just within the past couple months making this big push to for people to come back in. And so I'm doing a lot of observing while I'm in the office. How is it going? Do we feel equitable in the way that we're interacting with each other? Um, so I think this whole hybrid space that we're moving into is is new and interesting, but yeah. I don't have an answer, like a, a concrete answer. It It's so interesting, you know, thinking as you were describing, you know, people perceive you as warm and I see why they do, obviously, you know, and, and I'm thinking, and you're an engineer. I just think that's so cool, you know, because I work with lots of couples where one, usually the man, not always, 
copies in a heterosexual couple. It's usually the man who's the engineer, although I have actually worked with some couples where it's the other way around or where they're both engineers. But, you know, stereotypically, right, the engineers aren't the ones who are going to be able to say, hey, this is how something you said made me feel, or I want to give you some, you know, positive feedback or tell you something bothered me or whatever, you know. You don't hear that from engineers. You know, what I what I hear that is from again stereotypically the wives of engineers telling me they need to learn how to do that because it's driving them nuts. You know? mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of curious. You know, you seem to have you you blend that. I, I have to tell you, I'm a my um, degree before my PhD in psychology was in statistics. Mm -hmm. I'm an old statistics guy. So I was sort of the the gooey guy among the prickly people and the prickly guy among the gooey people. You know, uh, when I was doing my PhD in psychology, it's like I was the I was the weird prickly guy. And when I was doing my my um, master's in, in statistics, I was the you know, the uh, the weird gooey guy. So anyway, I, how do you how did you blend those things if you if, how'd you well, get to that? Yeah, I know, I know. Obviously you do. Well, I mean, it's it's a constant evolution of being able to blend it. And I, 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 a lot of that, what you just said about your experience really resonates with me. I, I think, you know, I've, I've ridden both of those across that, that knife edge as well. <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the ways I'm, I'm the second kid. That's one of them that pushes me more towards the gooey emotional side, right? The, the second kid can be less responsible. He's more. The second kid too. <laughs> yeah. And then, but I, I always loved math and science and order. I loved order and things. So that's where this project management is a great role for me. I'm married to an engineer. So my husband and I met at Cornell in the mechanical oh. engineering um, program. And so I think, you know, if you, you say the husband and the wife in that case, or the engineer, non-engineer, I think because of our genders, I, in our relationship, I also tend more towards the emotional side, right? So, but we're able to talk about work and we always have been, and that's also been a, a wonderful dynamic portion of our relationship where the work that he's doing is much more technical and the work that I'm doing is much more people focused and process focused. And so, you know, it sort of always is this amalgamation of it. And then at, at work, it, it has benefited me to have an engineering background because I, I find that the technical folks are the hardest to win over. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, they're so good at what they do. Right. And it can often be hard to break through into that, but I have this built-in sort of like cred like street cred on um, the engineers yeah right yeah you know how to speak their language yeah right and so that makes it easier for me to do my job because i you know i sort of get that inherent trust with them um so so like i said i have to work a lot harder on the the warmth and empathetic side because it is it doesn't come as naturally to me but i'm so interested in it and i'm so interested in doing a better job at the work in front of me and being a better person a kinder person that that I'm always working on it. So maybe one side is easier for me to come by, but the other side is interesting enough that that I'm always going to be striving for it. One thing, uh, I think probably it was about a year ago. I don't know if you guys have watched the show Ted Lasso or if I if Did, I asked you. Saw you a little I've of it. Seen a yeah, few I haven't seen. I've heard about it, but I haven't. Yeah, I I highly recommend that you watch it because that's who I want to be at work. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of kind and open-minded person who's always trying to figure out how to help people be their best selves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of if I had to pick one or the other, there's one that is more inherent and one that I'm working much harder mm -hmm. at doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, one of the things that, uh, and there's several reasons I ended up getting into clinical work, but one of the factors was when I was, I had just got my PhD in psychology, but it was on the research side. And one of the things that I, of course, I was teaching to graduate students was uh, based on a book that someone else wrote called The Human Side of Statistical Consulting, because I was working as a statistician and was noting that, you know, what I was recognizing and what this book was talking about was the results of a, of a technical consultation were at least as much determined by the human interactions as they were by the technical competence. Now, as you noted, 
you do need the technical competence. You know what I mean? Not going to work to be a consultant in a technical field if you don't know your stuff. But that's not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You also need to know how to actually relate to people in all the ways you're describing. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I'm always I because I, I think it's because of my own career and my own bent. You know, I love that intersection. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it, it's I really respect folks who are just on one side of that or the other. But I love the intersection between the two of them. And I like to embody that. You know, it, when you're describing Ted Lasso, the word that I would use um you can probably guess what word i would use what he's embodying stability no not that oh. one. <laughs> oh darn intimacy no, no faith faith that's oh. yeah that's uh, the shtick about you know our uh whoopsie oh. <laughs> that's, that's not water um you know be kind don't panic and have faith that's our seven words and the the uh it's the faith part that that sense of seeing everyone as right to be who they are even when they're messing up. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, we all mess up in various ways and we shouldn't and let's work to do better. But there is a fundamental rightness to who we all are. There's a fundamental rightness to reality. That's what I mean by faith. And that's, you know, to embody that, I, I strive for that as well. I think that's that's how you can not panic and that's how you can be kind. Right. You know, if you're in a panic, you can't be kind. So faith is how you can not panic. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, and I love, you know, Judy, you brought up that word stability and and how we were talking earlier, you were talking earlier about how um, intimacy and stability really go hand in hand. And it's interesting, you know, when I think about work and work relationships, and if something isn't working, and we are having an issue with a project, or we're having an issue with how people are working together, one of the things we can do is to change how we do it, change the process. Mm -hmm. And that that to me relates so heavily into that stability bucket, right? Like people want to understand what's coming next. They want to understand how, what everyone else is doing like that, you know, is, is, is so interesting in terms of the, their ability to feel stable. And so if something's not working, you know, we see that at the intimacy level, something's not working. We can change something on the stability side, right. To say, okay, let's change how we do this here mm -hmm. in, in, and then we let everyone know, and that gives them some some additional stability. Like yeah, we saw this, yeah. What stability is about is lowering anxiety, mm -hmm. which is what you know, and what intimacy is about is tolerating anxiety. If you lower the general anxiety level, you make intimacy more possible. You uh -huh. don't have as much anxiety; you have to tolerate then. Okay. So it's yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and then the past two years where we've had to move to Zoom and that all of the changes in work and the macroeconomic uh, forces at play, that has really shaken the stability. Which you know, I think I ended up seeing how that affected uh, people's ability for work intimacy, right? Of of being able to trust each other because none of that was there, yeah. right? Are we are we going to work this week or not? I don't know. Do yeah. I need to take a test this week or not? I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I think this would be a good uh, time for our listener question. You ready, June? Sure. Okay, let me pull that up here. Very curious uh, mm -hmm. listener question right. related to work. <laughs> I think this is the only question we've got like this. Yeah. And she even the writer even mentions that, but you'll you'll see. Okay, so our uh, listener question from Sophie. She writes, "Dear Bruce and Judy, I don't know if this question is up your alley or not." But I've heard you talk about couple relationships, and I think my situation qualifies, even if it's not what I usually hear you talking about on your podcast. I'm a 25-year-old single cisgendered heterosexual woman. I've been working at a large company for three years in the department that develops and offers training modules for the sales staff. I like this work, and I think I'm good at it, both the development part and the teaching part. So what's the problem? We work in teams of two. And for the past two years, I've been paired with an older woman. I'll call her Mary. I think she's around 50. At first, we got along well. Mary seemed to enjoy helping me improve my skills and mentoring me. But as I became more confident and started standing up for my own ideas, she started acting cold toward me. Lately, she barely talks to me. When we're presenting together, she puts on a show of being friendly, but it disappears as soon as we're done teaching. I've asked her if I've done something wrong, but she says no and moves away. I've tried talking to our boss, but she just says I need to work it out with Mary. This is really starting to hurt. 
What should oh. I do? Yeah, that's such a tough situation and so, so common. Mm. Like, Mary, uh, when Sophie first started with her, yes, obviously, that mentor relationship, it feels good. It feels like I, I'm adding value to this person and helping them add value to our work together. It looks like Sophie was right out of college, basically. She yeah. Was, well, I guess she was 22 when she started, so. Yeah, and it's very astute of, of Sophie to realize, oh, once I've become more competent, Mary's acting differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, bottom line, to be very blunt, and this is not me exercising my empathy super well, but I mean, M Mary's threatened, you know, she mm -hmm. feels very threatened by Sophie. I think that's very obvious in the description. And it isn't going to help for Sophie to, to go to Mary and say, did I do something wrong? Have I done something wrong? And I'm sure you see this in, in couples as well. It's not you, it's me. It's not you, it's, it's her. And it is you to her like she has a problem with you and how competent you've become yeah so you have to reframe it sophie sophie can reframe it to mary and say let's figure out where our common ground is you've done so much to help me grow and learn and provide value at this company i i value that work that we've done together obviously i couldn't have done this well without your guidance and your support Let's figure out how we can grow the work we do together, but let's figure it out together. You know, it's not, it's not anymore Mary guiding me. It's us guiding each other. How can mm. we help each other be better? How can we help each other? And Mary will either respond to it or, or she won't. Um, it's very hard once you have a closed mindset of like, mm. I feel scared. I don't know how I provide value anymore. There's this other person coming after my job. Right. Mm. Um, to switch that mindset into the growth mindset of, oh, right. I have provided a lot. I still have a lot to offer. Let's work on this together and show our, our boss together how we can grow the work we're doing. The boss in this case, I also feel like, you know, I, I had a wonderful boss um, at Burton who left about a year ago. And one thing that that he taught me and really relied on is something he called uh, clean escalation. So like when people are having an issue with each other, instead of the boss saying, hey, I'll deal with it with Mary, the boss say, let's work together with Mary yeah, on that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, the therapist that I am, I'm sitting there, you know, wondering that very thing i'm thinking ooh, you know i don't work in this that setting it's very different i get that but boy I, I would be thinking the boss needs to sort of do some therapy here as opposed to just saying not my problem you know right or like going to mary and saying so you know you're making right. sophie feel bad you have to stop like there's yeah. no there's no room there that just makes mary feel even more scared like how am yeah. i supposed to and putting on even more of a show whenever they're in front of the boss together one of the aspects of clean escalation is, you know, you, you hear that the issue is happening, you help give the tools to the individual that's having, that's recognizing the issue. So in this case, Sophie, the boss might say to Sophie, like, maybe try talking to Mary about it this way and let me know how it goes. You know, like, try to empower them to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't continues to not work, then sit down with them together and mm -hmm. help facilitate a conversation. Um, yeah, it, it does, it occurs a lot. Um, and and in, in the current work climate where there's a lot of opportunity at other locations, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of the times what we see is the, the person who feels unsatisfied leaves, right? So like the someone like Mary um, might, might sure. dig their heels in and say, well, I, you know, I've been here longer, I, I refuse to, and that kind of sh ends up shoving Sophie out, or vice versa, like, mm -hmm. Sophie, her work begins to shine, and Mary just continues to not be able to deal with it, and they don't address it as a work couple, and, and then Mary feels like she has to move on, and that's, it's really unfortunate, because, um, like, you can see that Mary's provided such wonderful input and guidance to Sophie and that Sophie really values that and has, has done really well at the company. And that's, that's huge. So like, if there's a way for them to um, modify their relationship, 
just like, you know, once, once you're married to somebody, you have a kid that changes the dynamic Mm -hmm. or, or even your, your spouse changes jobs or you move to a different city, anything that changes the dynamic, you sort of have to reevaluate, right? I'm sure you see this all the time. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Well. Sophie, I think you need to have a sit down with Mary. (laughs) Yeah. And and I think that was great advice that June just gave. It's funny. I'm trying to think in my uh, private practice that I can think of one situation, ooh, 20 plus years ago, where uh, someone came in with her boss uh, to work on, (laughs) and they both agreed to do that, you know? That's they wonderful. came to, and I have, I have no specific, you know, qualifications to work in that, that environment, but it seemed to be helpful. It's like, you know, it was stuff they just couldn't talk about. It was really becoming difficult. And so we talked about it and it seemed to help. So it, it's interesting, you know, I'm sitting here thinking you need a therapist and ideally, but, but it's so interesting because your boss isn't your therapist, right? but in a sense you are right. Like when you're managing a project, you are the person that is there to help things go better. And when there's interpersonal difficulties, you're going to help them with those difficulties. Yeah, of course. And actually that's an interesting point to be made. I'm, I'm none of these people's boss, right? Ah, I'm, I'm the project manager, but I, they don't report to me. They report to Uh, a functional manager, right? So in that sense, yes, I, I can provide that neutral third party voice uh, yeah. and listening ear. And so, so yeah, that's a big piece of it. And so that actually is another great piece of advice to give to Sophie is, is there somebody that Mary trusts a lot at work that Sophie can, A, try to get a window into Mary's, where Mary's thoughts are and, and like, how, how can she approach the conversation? How can Sophie approach the conversation with Mary a little bit differently? So she could get some insight from somebody else at work, but that is also a great Per- third party person to help mm-hmm. facilitate maybe it isn't their boss right yeah. like yeah. that is so interesting when you describe you know as a project manager you are not their functional boss you don't hire and fire them right. and that's and that's so like a therapist do you know what i mean <laughs> i'm the one who has no power here yep. other than you know other than what you invest in me do you know what i mean it's like if you you give me the privilege of asking you very personal questions and you're apt to answer them because you think I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. And, but what I don't have the power to do is pretty much anything other than, I mean, God forbid, you know, if they're saying child abuse or whatever, I have to report that, you know, and they know that up front. but I have no other functional power. And there are folks and I am one of them who I'm incredibly careful. If there are couples who seem to be headed for divorce and they're, they're working on whatever they're working on, they need to know up front. I will not be testifying for either side or mm-hmm. I, I will not be part of a, an adversarial procedure because I'll be useless to you if that happens. And, and that's, you know, that's not what this is about. And I've been, and not what I've been able to avoid that all mm-hmm. these 27 years uh, because people know up front, you know, if I see the signs of that, people have to know up front, I do not agree to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's important because otherwise, if I had, if I was perceived as having any actual power in the situation, I don't think I'd be terribly useful. That's, mm-hmm. that's interesting. You know, you can, to be in that role as a project manager. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge and something, you know, we work on all the time is how to maintain neutrality, how to ask the right questions to get people to, you know, come to, come to conclusions and decisions on their own. The only decisions that we make are, okay, am I going to take what I've learned from here and, and like adjust how we do things in order to, to help avoid issues cropping up in the future. So what else should we be asking you about? Oh, (laughs) what else would you like to say? Is there any, we haven't covered. No, like your questions have been great. I guess I'm curious to know a little bit more about what you're thinking now in terms of couples therapy and how, you know, do you wish to have more people come to you that are like, uh, like that, that work pairing that, Mm. that you mentioned came to you? What an interesting thought. I, I, that's a, you know, that it sounds like it would be interesting, an interesting thing to do. My, my first hesitation, although maybe it's also an advantage, you know, it, it's been so long. I've never really been, I mean, the only large, large organization I ever worked for was UVM. Well, and the state of Vermont, actually. The state of Vermont, as I was a state employee for about four years, four and a half years, and then UVM for a lot longer than that. And, uh, but since then, I haven't been in that scene. 
I was near it when I would go in a consulting basis and teach courses in data communications. I would go to all these very large companies, and but I was never part of it. And so that would feel to me a little like, gee, am I really qualified to do that? Having said that, it's intriguing. You know, I'm I'm imagining, gee, if Sophie and Mary came to me, I would I think it would be an interesting conversation. I have worked with friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with people who are whose relationship intimate friends. I mean, mm -hmm. not not sexually intimate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both married to other people, but but close friends who've had a falling out. Mm -hmm. And I have done that, and I found that fascinating. But I haven't done the work thing. But that's interesting, Junior. It's you know. Gee, if you if you want to send people my way, maybe I'll consider it. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing in this conversation with you is that you feel like it sounds like you you feel like there is a a significant difference, and I'm hopeful that in through this conversation we're seeing a lot of the commonality between personal mm -hmm. couples and work work partners oh, yeah. and 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 how a lot of those. Um, areas of thought can be transferred across either. I know I have a ton more to learn. I should pick up your book or your books and, and read those next. And, um, Feel free. and to anyone listening, that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, you know, once I read, read through those, I feel like we could have another rich discussion about, you know, where the, the ideas that, that you've written about may be able to apply to work or and in other ways in which like, Hey, what if we change the way we thought about this, then could it be more universally applicable um we so i feel a like joint book uh, happening here june i'm not sure oh, but, you know, <laughs> we can see about that uh yeah those those are great ideas yeah well thank you so much for doing this this is yeah been and... thank you for the invitation i'm so glad we met and uh i hope to be able to continue to bounce ideas off of both of you very good we thank well you. may like do that. this again down the okay line. sounds Thanks. great Well, that was a lot of fun. Yes, it was. That was very enjoyable. She had a lot to say about work relationships. And, you know, I wish I had, had known some of those things when I was a youngster starting out because I had experienced some of those problems in my working uh, life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very similar to the Mary Sophie letter. Mm -hmm. I had a boss. And then when I became a copywriter and started working and she became very threatened by me and, you know, kind of clamped down. And, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as June said, that's a, it is a common scenario. Yep. I'm not surprised we got a letter on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, that was a, a great uh, great, delightful interview. And, and um, if you would like to be interviewed yourself, or if you know of someone you'd like to see us interview, mm -hmm. drop us a line. Uh, you can email us at Bruce at ctn7.com or Judy at ctn7.com or just go to our website, ctn7.com. Where you can actually sign up for a time. I think we mentioned in the intro, you can do that uh, as June actually had done. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also, as I say, just drop us an email. And same thing, if you have a uh, a letter you would like us to cover on one of our podcasts, same thing. You can just drop us a line. Uh, the same email address is bruce at ctn7.com or judy at ctn7.com. Right. And don't forget that uh, you can follow us, find us wherever you get your podcasts, like us, rate us, five stars, of course. Yes. Um, and just and plain all. tell your friends, right? right? And share tell, us on social media. Tell folks about yes. us. Yes. Because that's, you know, expanding our readership. Mm -hmm. Also, another plug for the book that came out a couple of years ago that I wrote. Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And this is the paperback version I have in my hand, also available as uh, Kindle at uh, the, um, you know, an ebook, a mm -hmm. Kindle on the Amazon site, and also through the Amazon site as a audiobook right. where I did the um, narration and mm -hmm. uh, folks have told me they they like it that way. And, yeah, um, well, a lot of people listen to books. They do. Yeah. And uh, they, they seem to like the fact that I did it because mm -hmm. it, it sounded good. <laughs> it's like being in your office, it's like, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like being in my office, except that I don't know what you're saying back to me. So, a little different there. But, but you can yeah. write us and tell us. You can absolutely uh, do there that. There you go. And we hope you will. And so, um, until next time. Remember... Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Bye.